is recording. Yep, I think we're good. Okay, can you go back? No. Okay. Um, so Ambari uh, lets you set up um, alerts. Basically, uh, Hadoop operators, operators can get notified when something goes wrong in your cluster. Uh, you can set up thresholds so you know you can get notified when HFS capacity is low, lower than what you set it to. Um, you know, if there's any major performance degradation, you can get notified, things like that. And uh, you know, critical failures, like if the name notes down, you want to know right away. Um, and also, um, job analytics for uh, data workers. Uh, for example, on Hadoop, you can run MapReduce jobs, uh, you know, big scripts, type queries. Um, and, you know, you want to know if your jobs are running slow. You want to know why, what else was running on the cluster. Uh, you want to know the interdependency between uh, MapReduce job spawn in your big script or high query and so on. And, uh, and last but not least, uh, somebody lets you integrate all the Hadoop capability uh, to third party uh, applications. So, um, Ambari has its own web client, but um, it uses um, REST calls for every everything that it does. So there's no you know shortcuts or you know hidden private APIs. Um, REST API for doing everything that uh, Ambari lets you do. So here's sort of a you know very high level architecture uh, of Ambari. So as you see, the big box in the middle is Ambari server, and it um, exposes REST API. And Ambari has its own sort of native web client, which is Ambari Web, which is written completely in JavaScript. And as I, as I said, um, it uses uh, REST API for everything that it does. Uh, and we have configurable authentication providers for logging in. You can uh, configure Ambari to um, authenticate against an external Active Directory, uh, LDAP, LDAP servers, and so forth. Um, and also, um, Ambari manages uh, hosting a cluster by uh, through its agents. Agents is basically a daemon that runs uh, on the managed host. It's written in Python uh, and uses Puppet for some of the work that it does. Um, and also, um, you see on the lower right corner, there's um, SPI, that's the Service Provider Interface. And what this allows Ambari to do is uh, to make um, modules pluggable so you can integrate with um, Various metric, you know, metric providers, and Ambari, you know, currently uses Ganglia and JMX to get metrics. Um, but you could use something else and just plug it in. Uh, same thing for alerts. Um, Ambari uses Nagios by default, but you could use something else. And for you know, providing HFS mirroring capabilities, for example, we can use Ivory, you know, something like that. Okay, so um, at this point, I'd like to do a live demo of Ambari in its current state. So the latest available uh, version uh, that's on uh, the project website right now is uh, 122. Oh, what I do now? Oh, I see. Let me go to Chrome. Okay. I don't see Chrome. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, so um, what you see on the screen right now is a cluster that's already installed, uh, and it has um, four managed nodes. And just to show how the dashboard looks, um, Uzi is currently down. That's why you see it in red. But um, the dashboard sort of gives you a quick overview of what your cluster is doing. Um, so your HFS is healthy, MapReduce is up and running fine. You can see the number of nodes that are um, up. And for example, for HFS, you can immediately see the total capacity. Uh, and uh, for MapReduce, you, you know how many slots are being taken up, uh, things of that nature. On the right side, you see uh, cluster metrics. So these are sort of um, aggregate metrics for uh, network usage, uh, load, uh, memory usage and CPU usage. And um, see. moving over to HFS on the dashboard, you can expand it and see more details. Uh, and you see the pie chart for HFS capacity. Uh, we have plenty of space. And then uh, you can see <laughs> which host is running name node, secondary name node, data node, and so forth. Uh, so forth, and uh, you know if you're used to using the um, name node native web UI, then you can you know click and go over to that as well. Um, and you can there's a quick link feature to see you know name node logs, uh, JMX, uh, things like that as well. And same similar for MapReduce. And HP. Um, and uh, this is a more detailed services view. So in this view, you can see all the services that are installed on the cluster, um, and uh, detail summary, uh, high-level summary, uh, and uh, alert, if any. So basically, what you're seeing right now is um, all the alerts that have been set up for HFS, and the green checkbox is being shown, that means everything's okay. So, um, for example, alerts that this is checking for is, you know, certain percent of uh, data nodes are down, uh, or if uh, the name node process is down, things like that. And then for each service, we have a set of graphs. So these are metric graphs that pertain to HFS. So, for example, this one is total space utilization, um, number of file ops, um, RPC latency, uh, things like that. And uh, if you click into it, you can uh, expand the graph and see what it's doing. Um, and uh, by default, it shows the uh, last hour of activity. But you can go back and view more. And this looks kind of funky because of Ganglia already aggregation intervals, which uh, we can fix. But um, you get the idea. And somebody uh, provides uh, you know, standard operations like you know stopping HFS. There's also a feature uh, called uh, running smoke test. So this is to make sure that um, HFS is running uh, properly. Um, and it's important when you want to reconfigure HFS, because you know certain parameters could actually break the operation, standard operation of HFS. So um, you want to make sure that um, your HFS is uh, operational. Um, so these are sort of the configurable parameters for HFS. It's broken uh, down by uh, the role, name node, secondary name node, beta node, general settings, and a whole bunch of advanced settings that you can as well. 
well. And uh, similar uh, for MapReduce, you can see the metric uh, graph. And this is, again, different from HFS. This is specific, specific to uh, MapReduce. Um, Here we have a um, post tab where you can see all the um, posts in your cluster. Uh, and uh, <coughs> okay, yeah, guys on web webex, can you uh, mute yourself? Okay. Um, so here you can uh, quickly tell if the host is healthy or not. You see a green dot, it means all is good. If you see a red dot, then you know something is wrong. Which case, uh, in this case, this host has an alert. So if I click on that, then I can see, um, you know, Uzi server is not working. That's because uh, I shut down Uzi server before this demo. And then, uh, you know, if I click into it, then you can see what's going on in that host. Uh, on that host, again, you can see the um, system metrics for that specific host. And also, you can see all the um, services running um, on that particular host. You can see Uzi server is down. So at this point, what you can do is, you know, you can bring this up by saying like, start, and then uh, it'll start it up and run uh, smoke test to make sure Uzi is up and running. So we'll just let that run in the background. And alert should go away after it comes back up. Um, so that's the host uh, page. And of course, uh, it provides capabilities to add more hosts to the cluster. Um, so this is where you specify um, new host names, um, and you can add uh, any number of hosts here. So I'll just close that out for now. And uh, you have this jobs tab. So this is the job analytics part. And uh, it shows you all the jobs. So map, MapReduce jobs, uh, pick scripts, and hive queries that have run on the cluster. Um, and uh, if you click into each one, for example, this is a pig script that ran word count .pig. Um and you can see the amount of input and output uh, and how long it took. If I click on this, then you can see uh, this particular pig script spawned uh, three MapReduce jobs. And you can see this is the job submission time. The first job, MapReduce job, took a little more than 30 seconds. And then the next uh, MapReduce job got spawned and so on. This particular one is a very simple pig script, but, um, you know, you have more comp complicated uh, scripts where it spawns a whole bunch of MapReduce jobs. So you can see how sort of data is flowing and how long each uh, job is taking and things like that. Um, and uh, here's another view of this big uh, script. So this is specific to a particular MapReduce job in that uh, spawned by the big script. And you can see the timeline. So from job submission, you know, this might be a little hard to tell on the screen right now, but um, you can see how many map tasks were running, how many shuffles were running, and how many maps were running, and how long each took. Um, here's another view of the job where you, you can see, um, so x-axis is um, time since job uh, submission, and then y-axis is how long it took, and the size of each dot is the um, amount of data that it processed. So it gives you a different view um, to that job that you want to look at. And then you can see um, this view for uh, different jobs in the script. This is the uh, job analytics part. And it has extensive filtering. So you know, if you ran some uh, jobs, and if you want to sort of do a comparison um, uh, across different runs for the same application, so you can just create your filter, and then you can see uh, all the aggregate stats at the top. Um, admin page is 
right now it's kind of minimal. Basically, what you can do is you can create new users um, and make them admins and whatnot. Um, and uh, we have this feature called heat maps. And uh, in this view, uh, what you can do is you can select um, various metrics. So right now you can see, you can see uh, host metrics. Uh, for example, this space use is the default. And it's all green because um, it's within this threshold uh, defined here. So if it's green, it's you know, 0 to 20%. Now, if the uh, this space usage was more, then this would turn, you know, orange or red, depending on the actual um, space uh, consumed. And in this view, you can see sort of the memory usage on these two hosts. Um, memory usage you can see is 40 percent. This one is 47 percent. Uh, this one is 38, and so on. And if you see any problematic post, you can click on it, and you can see the details of that host. Um, and uh, not only uh, sort of system level metric, we can see service level metrics as well that pertain to, for example, HFS and MapReduce. Um, and uh, in this view, you can see that the middle ones are grayed out because they're not actually data nodes. They're just running uh, other master services like name node and job tracker and so on. Um, and uh, so we have this framework to um, easily generate um, heat maps and extend it. So um, currently we're working on providing um, HBase specific metrics um, to add to this heat map view. So that's sort of um, the state of Ambari today, uh, one to two version that's currently available. Um, what are we doing for time? So um, I don't have much time, so I'm going to skip the cluster installation part. If you guys want to see it, I can show it to you. But um, <laughs> okay. All right. Um, then I need to. This is. Okay. 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 Share terminal. Okay. Okay, so what I have here is um, an SSH terminal for a um, host in Amazon EC2. So it's pretty much um, clean um, RHEL 6 uh, host. And the uh, first thing you do is um, let's see if I can. Is to install the um, Ambari repo. It's a YAM repo. And once you do that, um, you'll be able to install Ambari. As you can see, it's downloading all the um, dependent packages. So Ambari server uh, depends on Postgres, so it's uh, installing Postgres right now, and then Ambari server itself.
Yeah, so basically what it's doing right now is installing Postgres from scratch. Um, that will, it might depend on how many posts are running and maybe. Yeah. So, um, the yum install Ambari server is done, and then the next thing you do is uh, Ambari server setup command. So, basically, what this does is uh, it initializes the Postgres database, creates all the tables. And also, another thing it does is uh, uh, it installs its uh, JDK. It downloads the JDK. And I've used the silent option, but basically it's prompting you if you want to disable SLE Linux, uh, if you want to turn off IP tables, things like that. Yeah, yeah, any host. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, setup is done, and then I, I can start it with this command, Ambari server start and uh, it's starting up a JD server. So um, we should be able to access that. Okay, so this is our brand new Ambari server. Uh, and you log in with the default admin password. Uh, and here you can set up your uh, cluster name first. And then, you know, you specify um, posts that you want to manage. And uh, specify SSH key is actually optional. So um, what it's doing right now is Ambari server is SSHing into these four hosts, and uh, it's setting up the um, repo and also installing the uh, Ambari agent package. Um, but uh, there's another option where if you don't want the Ambari server to do passwordless SSH into the boxes, and you can do it manually yourself. Uh, so there's an option for that in the previous screen that I just skipped over. And then you know, while it's installing, you can click on in the host and see what it's doing. And uh, Ambari also uh, runs sanity check to make sure that um, all the managed hosts are um, good uh, to continue with the install. For example, it checks to see if there are any um, Hadoop packages already installed on the managed host, uh, or it tells you if Java proxy is already running, and so things of that nature. Uh, in this case, you know, it's all good, so we can just continue. Uh, and then in this screen, you can select which services you want to install in your cluster. Uh, it's going to select everything. And then um, in this screen, you can select um, where ma masters should be hosted. So you can see on the right, uh, we have uh, three hosts 
that have masters of science. So Ambari does um, basically makes recommendations and you know on where where to put these uh, masters. But you can change them. So if you want to put name nodes like on a different host, you can do it like that. And also, um, you can by default, you, Ambari um, selects up to three Zookeeper servers. But if you want more, you can add them as well. In this screen, you can select um, slave to host assignments. So by default, Ambari doesn't put um, slaves such as data nodes, task transfers, or region servers on hosts that have been assigned masters. But um, you can override that and say, hey, I want data node on this node, this node, this node. And, uh, and client is where all the client packages will be installed, like uh, pig and hive and scoop and these things. Okay, and then um, in this screen, you can customize uh, services. So you can change any of these um, parameters, such as you know, name, where you want your name node directory to be. Uh, Ambari kind of does uh, you know pretty good job of guessing where you want uh, these things to go. So for example, on the host, uh, it's detected two mount points and it's suggesting that uh, name node directory directories be installed on these, things like that. Um, so I'm just going to use default settings for most, except for a couple of services where you need to supply parameters because there's no sensible default. Um, And then um, once you're ready to deploy, you can sort of review which services go where and things like that. If you're happy with it, you click the deploy button, and uh, that's that's about it for um, installing. Um, on the next screen, you'll be able to see the progress of the install. Uh, so first thing uh, is. Uh, at the top, you can see the overall progress, and then uh, you can see the host level progress. Um, it tells you what it's doing right now, um, and if you click on each, then you can see, you know, all the services that are queued up to be installed on that host. Um, and then, you know, if you want to see the details of that install, you can click on it, and you can see the uh, output. So. That's about it. I'm sorry? Uh, Ubuntu, yeah, we don't currently. So yeah, currently um, Bari supports uh, RHEL uh, and CentOS 5 and 6, and uh, SLED SUSE 11. Uh, doesn't run on Windows yet. <laughs> okay, cool. So. Um, that's it for a uh, live demo of Ambari. Um, and uh, let's see. Before I pass it over to Tom for the next presentation. Do I need to exit? Uh, I can close this out. And then PowerPoint. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so basically, um, the current release, as I said, is 1, 2, 2. Um, 1, 2, 3 is uh, coming out pretty soon in May. We're targeting May. And then uh, Mumbai 1, 3, 0 oh, with a bunch of new features uh, targeted for June. And Jeff can talk more about that later on. Um, and uh, also, you know, I'd like, I'd like everybody here to get involved in making uh, Apache on Bari better. Uh, there's a project website which has a you know, link to everything else that you, you would need. Uh, for Ambari users, you, know, you can ask questions on the mailing list um, or file bugs and enhancement requests from the JIRA. Um, that helps a lot with sort of the direction of you know, where Ambari is uh, going and feature set that you know, people want uh, so we can prioritize. Um, and then for Ambari developers, um, there's a bunch of information posted on the wiki. If you can just go to the project website and follow the links to the wiki, uh, their design docs and development guidelines. Uh, also instructions for building Ambari from source. Um, and uh, once you set up your dev environment, then you can start contributing patches to Zero. Okay, Tom, um, I'm going to make you the presenter now. Can you guys hear me? Shaku? Yep. You guys can hear me okay? Yeah, um, I just uh, made you the presenter. All right. Can you see that? Yep, we can see it. Um, Hey Tom, um, yeah, we need to adjust the mic. So can you talk for a bit? Yeah, uh, can you hear? Can you hear me? Hear me? Do you still do you still need me to talk? Or is it good to go? Okay, hey Tom. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you uh, just uh, get started, and we can adjust the mic as you speak. Okay. Does the uh, does the screen look okay? The presentation. Yeah, looks perfect. Okay. Uh, so uh, my name is Tom Bierbauer. I'm a developer here at, at HortonWorks on the Ambari team, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the APIs and and SPIs that we've developed uh, here as part of Ambari. Uh, I, I think the title for the presentation on the, the meetup is something like how to integrate uh, using the APIs and SBIs, but I'm not going to uh, really go into specifics on any any particular integration. Um, I'm, I think more going to talk about uh, kind of an overview of the APIs and, and SBI, and I think that'll tie in uh, nicely with Steve's presentation. Uh, so sort of I'll, I'll let you know what's available. Um, in this area, and then uh, Steve's talk, I believe, uh, goes into uh, the specific integration with the Teradata tools. So, um, kind of uh, in the interest of time, that the talk will be fairly high level, but uh, feel free to jump in with any uh, questions you have. I, I'll have a question and answers at the end, but uh, uh, you can feel free to interrupt me if, uh, if if you like, as long as we don't get um, too sidetracked. Um, so <clears throat> what I'd like to go over uh, today is to uh, basically give a quick overview of the APIs, uh, then talk about uh, monitoring and management, and uh, look a little closer at some of the uh, API constructs and uh, look um, quickly at um, responses from the API and, and error handling. And then um, sort of a very high-level description of the, the SPI uh, uh, that, that Yusaku mentioned in, in his uh, first slides. Uh, I'm not going to go into any, any code there. That'll be more of a, a high-level thing. And, um, and then I'll just uh, mention about uh, kind of extending through the SPI and an actual uh, uh, use case where we, um, we wrote custom resource providers. 
Um, so a goal of the uh, Ambari API is to be RESTful. And uh, so while, while we, we try to keep in line with the constraints of REST, that what I think that really means to us is that we are primarily aiming for um, a uniform interface to, to access the resources. And um, this means uh, both monitoring and management of, of the resources of a Hadoop cluster. Uh, so some of the features of the API include uh, partial response and, and query predicates. And I'll, I'll go into those um, a bit more in, in the upcoming slides. Um, so <clears throat> here, uh, monitoring is, um, we're talking about the ability to, to, to read the state of the, the resources of the cluster. Uh, so in this example here, um, we're getting a, a name node uh, component resource. So what that really means here is that we are uh, getting the, the uh, component named name node for the service named HDFS for the cluster named cluster one. So you can see that uh, right under where it says example there is the actual uh, request. <clears throat> and then below that is um, part of the response. I, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't actually fit the entire response in here uh, with the size that you could see. So um, I just put a bit of it up here so that uh, I could talk about it a little bit. But what you can see there is uh, the first href is the, the actual, um, uh, the actual uh, URL for the request that we, we made to get this response. And then below that are, uh, are some of the metrics that are returned uh, for this name node resource. Um, also not shown here are, would be the, normally would be the sub resources um, underneath this, this resource. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about sub resources on, a, on an upcoming slide. And I'll, um, I'll show you some actual queries so that we're not limited to what I can show here. Um, but I'll just go on for now to, um, to resource types. Uh, there's basically two uh, types of resources, <clears throat> uh, collection uh, resources and instance resources. So uh, you can see in, in these examples here, uh, a collection resource is something like services. So um, requesting it returns a collection of services, um, whereas an instance resource is um, something uh, like HDFS, which is a single specific service. So uh, in, these, in, the, in the top most uh, example there, you can see uh, we're getting all of the services for the cluster named cluster one. And in the, um, in the bottom example, we are getting the specific service named HDFS for the cluster named cluster one. Okay, so um, when you make a, uh, a response, uh, when you make a request through the API, you get a uh, response, which is in JSON format. Um, and you'll get slightly different responses uh, for the different types of uh, resource types. Uh, so um, the collection, a collection resource response always includes um, the request href, uh, the items of the collection. So like if, if it was for services, you'd see, uh, you'd see all of the services. Um, then each item contains the href to go directly to that instance resource and the primary fields of that item. And I'll show you an example in the next slide. Um, and then with instance resources, that always includes the href and the um, primary identifying fields of that, that item. Uh, they may also include metrics and sub-resources depending on any partial response or query predicate info that you have specified. And again, I'll give, I'll give some more uh, in-depth examples of those um, coming up. So here's, um, here's a response uh, for a, um, a collection resource, and it's for services. So you can see uh, the first the first item there is the href that um, that got this response, 
and uh, underneath that is the items. And the items in this case will be all of the services. So I'm going to hop out here to a browser and, and actually show you what this looks like for real. Uh, can you guys see that okay? Yep. Okay, so here um, I've requested the uh, the services for uh, for cluster one, and you can see here uh, this is the href, which is the same as up here, and then uh, we see the items here. Um, the items are the services that we requested. So this is a collection of services. And um, underneath each one of these, we see the href that will take you directly to the, um, the item itself. And um, underneath that is uh, the identifying fields for that item. So the, the identifying fields for a service are going to be cluster name and service name. So it'll be the, it'll be the same fields for all of these with, with different values, obviously. So if we want to... Um, uh, you can use, use this href here. We can go look at the HDFS service there. And that's, that's an example of an instance resource now because we are asking specifically for the HDFS, uh, the HDFS service. So underneath the, um, the uh, HDFS service, you can see we have some properties here uh, particular to the HDFS service. Its cluster name is cluster one. Its state is started and, and so on. It has some configurations associated with it. And then it has um, sub resources underneath it. HDFS has, uh, services have components underneath that. So underneath the HDFS, we have name node, secondary name node, HDFS, client, and data node. So I'll jump back to the presentation. And here's what I just, uh, basically what I just showed you. This is an instance resource for a cluster one, but I just showed you the, the one for uh, HDFS. So I'll go on from here. <clears throat> okay, um, partial response is a uh, feature of the API that allows you to uh, restrict what is returned uh, from a query. Um, and also, in some cases, it allows you to actually expand what is returned from a query. And I'll go into that a bit more in a second. But um, with partial response, you can, um, you can specify properties, categories, or sub-resources. And I just showed you what a sub-resource is uh, in terms of, a, of a, a service. Services have components underneath. Um, and then also, um, you saw where we had, in that previous response, where we had the, um, the sub-resources but they only, the sub-resources only uh, showed very limited information. So we saw the href and then the identifying fields for the, the sub-resource. Well, if you wanted to show more than that, you can, um, you can specify specific fields through uh, the, the partial response uh, query string, or you could actually even uh, specify a wildcard if you wanted to fully expand uh, the sub-resources. Okay, um, so the... I just mentioned the, uh, the primary ID fields of the sub-resources. The primary ID fields of resources and sub-resources are always shown um, regardless of the, uh, the, um, what is specified in the, uh, the partial response. Um, so I can show you uh, some examples of a partial response. Here's... Um, Here's one where we ask for, this is where we're trying to uh, reduce what is returned actually. Uh, so instead of getting all the metrics back, in this case, we just want back the specific metrics um, RPC sent bytes. So uh, you see here in response, we have uh, a category metrics, which has a subcategory RPC, which has a field called sent bytes. So again, if I jump out to the browser, <clears throat>
Uh, this is so. This is an example of where we actually go um, getting um, uh, getting the um, field specific for a component. So you can see in this um, in this partial response, we're specifying uh, components, and then underneath the components, we're specifying metrics, JVM, and GC count. So we're getting additional information uh, for these these subcomponents. Um, we have metrics, JVM, GC count here for job tracker and for task tracker, and it's it's not available from for the MapReduce client, so we don't we don't see it here. But you can see this is actually um, giving us additional information. Uh, where if I get rid of if I get rid of this, we don't see that. Okay, um, so for um, this is this is basically what I just showed you—the partial response that in, includes the, um, the fields of the, the subcomponent. So um, query predicates is another way of, of controlling what is returned uh, through the API. So the query predicates limit the set of the resources returned by the query. So it's basically like a, a WHERE clause in a SQL query. So um, uh, basically, we have the, the operators that you see here, along with um, a limited set of functions. Um, we have right currently we have the in function and is empty. That's that's um, that's all we support for now. But um, I'm sure we'll be adding additional ones in the future. Uh, so here in this example, we see a query for all of the. Um, the services that have been started. Uh, so, um, yeah, basically, uh, there are. Uh, let me just show you this in the browser as well. So if I if I look at um, the, if I look at HDFS here, I can see that it has a, a property called uh, called service info um, state. So I can query for that uh, that specific um, property. This is what I want. So um, I could, I could uh, here I've queried for on all the services. I'm getting service info state where state e where it equals started, and you can see I get a list of of uh, of uh, states or services here where the state is equal to started. Okay, uh, from the management side of things, we support uh, create, update, and delete of resources. In this example, uh, we're creating a cluster named C1 and setting its uh, version value. Uh, the field values are uh, here passed as uh, JSON in the body of the post. So you can see in under cluster, uh, the category clusters, we have a field called version, and we have a value there that uh, we want to set when we create uh, create the cluster. Um, here's an example of an update where we're going to update all the installed services to be started by um, by updating the state. So um, notice that we specify a query predicate here where our state is installed. So again, the field values are passed in the body of the put. So we are uh, changing the state to to started. <clears throat> and here is simply uh, a delete. So we're in this one. We're deleting the cluster C1. So this um, this request basically gets delivered to the resource provider for the um, the cluster resources, uh, uh, which communicates to the back end to delete 
delete the cluster. And I'll talk a, a little bit about uh, resource providers in a, in a few minutes when I talk about the, um, the SBI. Uh, real quickly, here's the, uh, here's the chart of possible return codes from the API. It's, um, it's mostly self-explanatory. Um, but here's, here's, here's a quick example, uh, some quick examples. Uh, in a first one, uh, a request for a resource that doesn't exist um, results in a 404. And um, in the second one, a, uh, a bad request to an existing resource results in a 400. Um, the difference, difference being that in the second one, the, cluster, the, the resource we're requesting is, is the cluster and cluster one. <laughs> Uh, people on WebEx, can you uh, mute your mic? Okay, so um, just to quickly go over the uh, the SPI. Um, the SPI was created around the uh, service framework um, that we use to access the resources from the back end. So this allows us to plug in um, custom resource providers. Uh, like Yusaku uh, mentioned, we have we have providers for accessing uh, things like um, Nagi S and Ganglia and JMX, and um, we we provide those as a uh, as the default providers. But if you wanted to plug in something uh, different, there's a, a way to do it. And uh, <clears throat> also, we have the, these uh, these resource providers uh, for the different resource types. Uh, like cluster, service, host, and component. And uh, those currently, um, the default resource providers out of the box uh, talk to the, the Ambari, uh, Ambari backend, the, uh, the Postgres database that Yusaka mentioned earlier. So um, for uh, customizing, uh, customizing um, uh, the, an installation with, uh, through, by, by changing the resource to run the SDI. Um, this is a, we have an actual use case where we wanted to be able to use uh, the Embari API on top of a GS installer installed cluster. So uh, we achieved this by writing uh, custom resource providers to re replace the default ones. So um, we can uh, swap out the resource provider and, and plug in a uh, custom one. And uh, in this case, the custom uh, provider pulls the resource de definition from uh, GS installer artifacts instead of from the, uh, the Ambari DB. <clears throat> so that's a, a, a real high uh, overview of, of the SPI. Um, uh, I can um, provide details if anyone's interested in it. They can contact me and I can uh, give, give some more uh, detail information or I think um, I don't know that we've made it public yet, but we do have a documentation. Uh, we do have some documentation on the on the uh, the SPI that um, we can release. So that's it for uh, for that. Are there any questions and answers? Uh, questions that I can answer? That's it then. So Yusako, I just um, I just switch that back to you. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, sorry, this is Mike Coots, Teradata. I had a quick question. Um, is there a way in that post mechanism for renaming a cluster? So you kind of assume that the cluster already exists as C1. Can I rename it? Um, so, yeah, the, the, the API doesn't uh, prohibit that. I don't know if we support that uh, through the, 
uh, all the way through the back end yet. Saka, do you know uh, what would happen if we tried to rename a cluster? I don't think we support that, actually. So, Tom, this is Adiv. Uh, so, you can't rename a cluster right now, so we don't allow that. Uh, stuck with the name, stuck with the name uh, for now. But there is, there is, uh, there is provisioning. We already thought about that people will want to mm -hmm. actually implement that uh, if you want to implement it as a feature. But uh, but right now it's. Uh, but 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 I guess the, the cluster name is provided during the Ambari installation itself, I assume. So we could name a cluster, but during installation time. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Over to Steve. So, so the question was, uh, how many clusters can Ambari manage? So um, right now, Ambari's web UI can only handle uh, one cluster. But um, you know, Ambari was uh, designed to handle multiple clusters, so that's why in you know API calls you specify you know clusters and then cluster name. So it needs a little bit to be able to handle. Okay, Steve, um, I handed over the presenter role to you, so uh, whenever you're ready, let's get started. Okay. Are you able to see the slides? Yes. Okay, great. All right, um, so my name is Steve Ratai, and I work at Teradata on the Viewpoint team as the architect on that team. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background on um, what Teradata's involvement has been here, um, one of the products that Teradata is delivering today is the unified data architecture. Uh, so what this is is a combination of both the uh, um, Teradata database that's been around for, oh gosh, 20 or 30 years now, a uh, standard relational database, uh, as well as Aster, which was a, a purchase that Teradata made a couple of years back. Um, and Hadoop uh, as of the last oh, year or so, um, and combining all this into a single appliance that's delivered um, by Teradata. Um, so in order to facilitate management of data across these three different technologies, there's connectors that are implemented between the different uh, systems. And uh, the relevant part for this presentation is trying to get Teradata Viewpoint to monitor uh, the entire appliance. So not only Teradata and Aster, but also Hadoop. So in terms of the architect architecture behind Viewpoint, um, it runs on a, a Viewpoint managed server, uh, which is just a, typically a Dell node. Um, and we have a couple different components. The, the main component to, to look at here is the data collection service. So it's a, a, just a core Java process. And what it's doing is going out and collecting all the data from the systems that are under its management. Uh, so originally that was just Teradata, so one-to-end Teradata systems. Uh, in the last year or so, we've added support for Astro. Um, and now we're adding support for uh, Hortonworks data platform. Uh, it has a, its own alert service and uh, that's managed over uh, messages on an ActiveMQ bus, um, as well as a front-end portal that I'll demonstrate in a little, straight in a little bit. And uh, we also use Postgres as the back end. Um, so at the end of the day, Viewpoint's providing a web interface to uh, monitor and manage the different systems that are part of the Teradata infrastructure. So last year we were looking at how we'd go about monitoring Hadoop. And as I started to dig into it a bit, this is kind of what the, the ecosystem looked like without Embari. Uh, so we're looking at different technologies and formats. So I think some of these were already mentioned in the, the other presentations, but you have Ganglia for getting uh, primarily a lot of the node level metrics. 
You have Nagios for handling alerting, uh, JMX to get data from a lot of the different services, and some of those uh, hideous web interfaces that have been part of uh, Hadoop that are, would probably involve uh, trying to scrape uh, HTML off the screen. So those are a bunch of different disparate technologies, different formats of data, different uh, ways to access the data. Um, in terms of connectivity, there's also issues uh, in our customers' environments, being able to actually have the connectivity to all the different nodes in the system that we'd need to access. Um, so not only physical connectivity to all the nodes, uh, but also any kind of firewall access to the different ports that are, all these services are running on. And when you start to get into high availability, high availability or any kind of a reconfiguration, uh, Viewpoint would need to know the location of each service. So where's the name node running? Where's the job tracker running? And have a way to either configure or uh, discover the location of all those services. So we were looking at this and really saw a lot of challenges in order to be able to uh, monitor Hadoop with the, the technologies that were out there and, and readily available, say, say about a year or so ago. Um, so Ambari to the rescue for us. So as, as Tom demonstrated, uh, Ambari provides a, a series of RESTful APIs. Um, so this gives us a, a uniform way to access the data over HTTP um, and also a, a uniform response format. So all the data is coming back in JSON. And for us, it was Java to parse the data, but no matter what your language is, there's libraries to parse JSON response. So there really, sh really shouldn't be any tie into any specific uh, server-side language that you're using. Uh, it also provided a single server and port for us to access. So from the customer's configuration standpoint, they only need to know where Ambari is running on their, no on their Teradata Hadoop system and what port it's running on, and that's all they need to configure. Everything else is handled through Ambari. So in order to access the APIs, Viewpoint is a heavy user of Java as well as the Spring framework. Um, so we have been using Spring's REST template class, which uh, for those of you that are familiar with Spring, follows all the other template style classes for JDBC, uh, JMS, accessing all those other resources. Uh, so it handles making the HTTP call to the URL that's specified as well as taking the JSON results and binding those back to Java model objects uh, using the Jackson the JSON library. In terms of the mechanism that Viewpoint's using to access this data, uh, we typically collect the data every minute and we store that back into Viewpoint's Postgres database. So the collection service on the back end is calling all those RESTful APIs that Tom mentioned and uh, getting the data back over HTTP and storing that into our Postgres database. So that uh, makes two different things possible for us. One, it um, allows us to use our rewind technology, which lets the user go back in time and see what the system looked like at a particular uh, point in time. So that might be last night when you had a bad job running on the system or last week just to get a point of reference for what was running uh, Tuesday night last week or two weeks ago. Uh, we can also generate charts and trending graphs to show how that data is changing over the, over the uh, last hour, day, week, and so on. All right, so let me bring up a live demo here. Um, so this is the, the viewpoint portal. And one of the things that I mentioned at the beginning is that we want to enable, at least for, for Interity's perspective, we want to uh, enable, let me log back in. What we want to do is enable support of the monitoring of the entire ecosystem, uh, the, the entire unified data architecture. So we're looking at 
Teradata, Aster, and Hadoop. One moment here. Like my demo server rebooted on me. Okay, so one of the standard portlets that's part of Viewpoint is the system health portlet. So here we can see a, a Teradata system, an Astro Data system, and a Hadoop system. Um, so what we're looking at here is a, a series of metrics that have been pulled from the Ambari API. So we're looking at things like the overall CPU across the entire system, um, the total disk space that's being used by HDFS, and then looking also at more detailed uh, service-specific metrics, such as the RPC latency for the name node and job tracker, um, number of jobs that are running, map tasks, reduced tasks, and so on. So this gives you a sense of some of the data that's available um, via the Ambari APIs. Um, over here on the top left, we have our node monitor portlet. Uh, so we're looking at all the nodes that are that are on the system. Uh, so the master node here has the name node and job tracker services running on it. Um, so I can look at the metrics for this particular node. So look at the CPU utilization, memory, and so on, as well as look at all the services that are running on this system. And so if I'm interested in the job tracker, I can drill down on that guy see information about the, the JVM, the job tracker JVM, so heap memory usage, thread counts, and so on. And also look at job counts, slot usage, tasks that have been run in the last hour. And finally, we have a Hadoop services portlet that looks at um, all the different services that are running on the cluster. Uh, so you can see at the bottom here, uh, some of the ones that, that don't have a ton of data available, um, or at least showing an up and down status for them. Uh, some of the more important services like MapReduce, HDFS, and HBase, uh, we're showing detailed information for. So you get a quick level view of whether all the task trackers are live or not, um, some of the metrics for the job tracker, job metrics here for Map, map and reduce uh, tasks that are running, as well as the graphs at the top that are showing, uh, again, some of the same metrics about HDFS and the MapReduce services. So that's just a, a very small slice of the data that's available um, in Ambari. Those are the things that um, Viewpoint was focused on, especially in terms of monitoring for the first release. and. Uh, we'll be continuing to add more features uh, as they are implemented in the Ambari monitoring APIs. Um, so from our perspective, uh, the benefits of using Ambari, uh, we were able to take Ambari and deliver a, a pretty comprehensive Hadoop monitoring solution, and it only took us a couple months to do with uh, a few developers working on it, but not an overly large team. Um, we primarily have Java and web developers. They're pretty knowledgeable about Teradata, but really didn't have a whole lot of Hadoop knowledge on the team. Um, so we were able to stay focused on the tasks that we're good at. So building the backend collection service to get all the data, um, as well as building the, the UI to display all that information that we're collecting on the backend. Um, so we were really able to focus on those particular tasks and um, not get bogged down too much in all the details of Hadoop, um, both from understanding the um, the things that were important to see, and as well as uh, not having to deal with any of the real low-level details about how all the services run um, and how they expose their data. Um, so overall, it was a, a really beneficial for our team to be able to use Ambari and um, allowed us to deliver a, a real high-quality solution in a relatively short amount of time. 
Uh, so that's it. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Any other questions? So, um, Steve, the question was, um, when, um, it integrate when viewpoint and um, I guess where, where all the metrics are coming from or Aster? Where they're coming from for Aster? Was that the question? Yeah. Um, so, Aster has a, a, rest, a similar API, a RESTful API that um, we're able to access to get the Aster data, the metrics from the Aster system. Um, so so really the, uh, the Ambari service was, was fairly similar in terms of uh, how the data was being provided to the Viewpoint Collection Service. The question was, um you also provide how many queries are running concurrently? Yes, so there's a count of the, the jobs that are running as well as a breakout of the, the map tasks and the reduce tasks for the, the jobs that are going through uh, through the map reduce framework. Just counts at this time. So uh, just to differentiate between, between the, the two things, so Teradata has its own monitoring as well that's going on. So in, in the viewpoint stuff that Steve showed, so in that there's parts of Teradata where, he, where they, those guys can show what queries are running in Tala and what queries have, are using, uh, what kind of memory they are using. But for the Hadoop stuff uh, is, is what Steve was talking about, where we can show the number of jobs that are running and uh, just uh, the map tasks that are running. Right? Yeah. 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 No, 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 not, not in You can probably do that if you want to add the new service or something like that, We're using the provider. Yeah. Any other question? So, so, so the question was um, the rewind fe uh, feature that was mentioned in the presentation. Is it part of Ambari? No. In the presentation. Oh, rewind. So rewind something that's part of viewpoint. Um, but I believe Ambari has similar functionality. Um, so in viewpoint, we we kind of have the the concept of going back in time, so you can change the the screen, and I can show that real fast. Yeah. yeah, so Ambari API lets you specify the time range uh, for which you want to recreate the metric for. So, yeah. yeah, so in Viewpoint, we store all the data in our local database, and this is the way that just kind of the, the pattern that we followed for previous systems that we've monitored, both Teradata and Aster. We follow the same approach for Hadoop as well. Um, so here I've rewound back an hour. Uh, so this is what the screen would have looked like if you were looking at it uh, an hour ago, which was 7:25 for me. Um, but we're we're all this data is coming out of our database, and we repeatedly pull the Ambari API every minute or so to to get the data. Um, As such, so the that, Ambari, that's the mechanism that's that Vpoint uses. The Ambari APIs also have uh, temporal data, so you can query the data from what time range is setting on. So you can
As a, sorry, so the question is, uh, is there any throttling mechanism in the body where you actually, uh, where the API throttling occurs so that if you call API too many times, it, it throttles? So as of now, there is, there is a throttling framework that is, I'm assuming you don't have too many folks uh, looking at your looking at the API or something like that. But if you need to, if you see a need for that, we'll definitely do it. Yeah. That is true. So, but usually the API frame, meaning the server is built in a very flexible manner and also it's very quick in responding to these APIs. So, we don't use up that much of uh, either bandwidth or, or CPU. Not, not seen need for that. Definitely something we can take care of. Do we have any other questions? Okay. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Steve, for your presentation. It was really exciting to see a uh, live demo of their, their viewpoint and uh, of our integration. Um, so I'm gonna. Thank you. I'll pass control back to over to you. Okay. Hey, one of you. All right. Is that good? Oh. Yep. Okay. Yeah, any questions on the WebEx, go ahead and send it in chat and monitor monitoring. All right. I'm uh, Jeff Spazetti. I'm a member of the product team here at Hortonworks and want to talk a little bit about the future of Ambari and how we're kind of taking our spin on, you know, where Ambari goes from both a management tool and kind of like an operational framework. We talked a lot about APIs earlier, how people can integrate, you know, how can they extend it. There's also, you know, we showed demo where we had end user features in a UI. And we kind of want to satisfy both cases here, a, a robust API for people to integrate with, as well as end user features out of the box that people could use directly in the, the web UI. Uh, so really three areas we want to invest in moving forward. And one, it's a, around cluster operations and adding more and more capabilities to Amari. So add them to the UI so that the operator has all the tools they need to manage the cluster. So right now we kind of have the basic start, stop, service, push configs, things like that. And we'll continue to add on to that, and we'll talk about some of those features. And when we add it to the UI, we're also adding the API. So we kind of believe when you put the UI out there, we make the API available. You can integrate at the API level. You can look at the UI. It's all out in open source. You can sit there and go look at the code. You can make the same API calls. You know, everything's all right there for you. The second level is really around uh, job diagnostics. So it's, it starts building on the thing that, um, that Yusaku showed earlier in the demo, where it was. Uh, looking at jobs and seeing the DAG and how you can actually see tasks and scatter plots start start building out. So investing a lot more there, both at the UI level as well as the API level. And the third is all about making the platform extensible. So REST API, pluggable providers, the SPI, things like that. So I'm going to double click into each one of these areas and kind of give you a picture of what we're looking at. There we go. Cool. So 1.3 is what's currently in development. So if you go check out, is it Trunk or whichever branch <laughs> you want to go look at? Um, 1.3 is currently in development, and we're targeting that to, to call for a vote for a release in the May timeframe. Um, but really, some features we want to add here, everything from making it easier to manage configurations and really control them at the host level, uh, being able to do more with HBase from multi-master and extending our heat map capabilities, uh, talk about capacity scheduler, 
adding more database support, being able to actually initiate a cluster upgrade from Amari. So you can actually sit there, hey, there's a new stack version available, how do I actually push that out? So you actually don't have to go do that in all manual steps. Uh, think about Kerberos. So people will secure their clusters with Kerberos, how do we make that more configurable? Um, when it goes to authentication to Ambari, making it easier for people to map their LDAP groups to Ambari user roles. So actually making that happen and then job diagnostics. So kind of give you a flavor, that's the high level bullets, but let's talk about the features themselves and kind of show them. Um, so from configuration management and host exceptions, it's kind of the idea that not all your hosts in the clusters are the same. So you would be able to actually go and override properties for one or more hosts and be able to change the configuration and then push them out. So just basically in our UI, be able to add an exception, designate certain hosts, remove it, push it out, and then we'll be able to manage that for you. So the UI will have it there as an end feature, but then our API will support that idea of, you know, ultimately this, this layering of service component host and effective config that people have available to them. So end user feature that ultimately you also can access via the API. Then under the hood, not only are we doing this layering and overriding, uh, we'll give you the ability to version it. So I'll be available to you at, under the hood for you. Capacity scheduler. So this is, you know, one of the algorithms for scheduling MapReduce jobs. So we're going to put a basic UI out around how people can manage queues for capacity scheduler. So really setting up their queues, splitting out the capacity and all the different properties that go along with that. This is just the basics to manage what is inside of capacity scheduler XML. Um, so this will be our first cut at that. So you see your different queues and how it actually breaks out. Um, but then over time, as part of like longer term roadmap, we'll actually make the analysis of this more robust. So what was queue utilization and get usage reports for each user and what they were doing. But right now, you know, our first launch will be around the, the basic for managing capacity scheduling. Uh, more databases. So this is more databases at the Ambari level. So right now, when we did the initial install, it did a Postgres, a Postgres install to store all the configs and network topology info. We'll extend that to support MySQL and Oracle. So just when we walk into companies, that's exactly what they expect. They just, you know, a lot of choice there. As well as the components that we're installing from the stack, whether it's Hive or Uzi, um, giving them support for MySQL and Oracle too. So um, by default right now, um, with Hive, we have support for MySQL, and Uzi actually uses Derby, but we're extending it and really trying to get consistent across the board. Postgres, MySQL, and Oracle. Over time, you'll see us, you know, make that full matrix available. Um, more heat maps, so um, more so specific H-base region server type metrics, making them available in heat maps. And this is actually a pretty easy integration for us to pull off. It's actually only like a couple of JavaScript files that you're able to add into the code, and next thing you know, you've injected a new metrics and it renders into heat maps. So this is kind of a real good place for people who want to see metrics and want to be able to show them in a heat map view. You can extend the product pretty easily there when you contribute the code. Um, and so when you, you know, you saw we did this demo, we have kind of the basic ones, we're adding some more, it's a really good place for people to add stuff. And it's just, you know, what you saw from Tom showing the API and what the Viewpoint guys did, there's a lot of metrics available. So you can always, you know, we can build this list out. And then ultimately over time, we'll make it so it's actually configurable so you can kind of walk through a wizard and say, give me this metric, give me this type of chart, save it type thing. But at least now we're just starting to get through the, the process of adding more explicitly to the product, but we'll make it more configurable. From an HBase master side, so um, today's 1.2 version of Ambari supports one HBase master, but you know, built into HBase, it supports multi-master, so we'll actually let you add more than one master. So you can actually configure that during install time or post-install, just add more masters, and they kind of manage it themselves. So we're making that available for our HBase frame. Other things in the UI, so uh, when you're looking at a host, you can actually, uh, we want to give you the ability to add nodes components to it, so you might not have designated to run all slave components out of the gate. So how do you turn it into a data node or a task tracker or a region server if you're using HBase? So post-install, you can do that. As well as starting and stopping all services, so kind of across the board, orchestrated start and stop. Right now, we're kind of letting you manage each service individually. You can do it kind of wholesale. Reassigning master components, so this is just the case where Hey, you know, my name node is a hardware for refresh or maintenance situation. I actually need to put my name node someplace else while I go refresh some hardware. And maybe I move it back to new hardware, give people the ability to move their master components around. And then just some UI improvements. One to highlight is really around host status. So, like, you've got a lot of hosts in your cluster. They're all green. And the, all the 
things that happened besides that. I lost my heartbeat, one of the components is down, one of the master components is down, as well as some other UI things that we're doing, we're doing overall. From a job diagnostics perspective, so we looked at some of the graphs that exist today, so the swim lane and the, the task and timeline and scatter plot, we're actually starting to merge those things together because you, we want to give people a whole a holistic view of how that script or query ran inside of their cluster. So we're starting to merge the idea of the job DAG with the task view. So you can actually see the breakdown of during this execution here. And when you see, you know, multiple things happening in parallel, it'd be great to see all the different maps or uh, shuffles or reduced tasks you see in one shot, as well as the combined scatter plot. So you really get a perspective of which job as part of this overall script that ran in your cluster was taking the longest and actually process the most data. So we're starting to merge those things together. And then over time, we'll get to a place where people can overlay other cluster metrics on top of this, because we have it all available in the API. We just have to get to the right UI experience for it. So what else was happening in the cluster at the time? What other jobs were running in the cluster? Um, tell me why this job that ran last night ran differently than the one that ran a week ago. So as people start getting a sense of today's run versus last week's run, they can do comparisons. And over time, we'll also give them the ability to set deviations. Like, if it gets too far off track, how do we actually tell people, give me an alert because I'm going to miss my SLA because this job ran slower last night than I, than I set up with my business. Um, beyond 1.3, other features we're looking at from an ops perspective, uh, enabling rack awareness. So you can kind of set that, and Ambari will distribute the, the rack awareness scripts across the cluster. Uh, log aggregation, so how do you get access to all the logs that are across all the different services on the cluster and make it available from one place. Uh, initiating an HDFS rebalance or an H-based compaction, full stack HA. So HA being baked in, you know, it's available in the 1.0 line via VMware or Red Hat. Um, in the 2.0 line, it's also available natively in that stack. We want to make that available from Ambari, both from a how do you install a cluster and set up HA and manage it over time. Uh, fine agreement on Ambari user roles. So right now there's kind of two roles baked into the API and the UI. It's kind of either you can do everything or you can read. We're going to end up ultimately mapping back more roles and permissions uh, based on what anybody needs to do. Uh, metric graphs, we talked a little bit about that. We're baking a lot of stuff into the UI today, but there's a lot of metrics available. Let's give people the ability to go and customize and change it themselves. Uh, we talked about the capacity schedule of usage reporting. Then we start getting into some business continuity type things. So how do we actually put a feature in Ambari that lets you initiate like HDFS mirroring as an example? So I can set up a data set and actually schedule to move data between clusters and then see the results of those things. And then Ambari server HA. So we've kind of designed the server and implemented it in a way that it is really stateless. The idea is we should be able to scale out the Ambari server. You scale out your backend database and it's really just REST calls from the UI. We should be able to pull that off. We're going to have to do some work to get the agent and server communication to really work in line. But over time, we'll implement that and make that available for people. I want to talk a little bit about stacks, because this is an extensible point for um, Ambari. So right now, Ambari comes, and it's you know out there in open source, and has a definition of a stack associated with it. So when you go to do an install, you actually say, hey, I want to go install this stack. And HTTP is what's there today. So a stack tells you which services are available and where do I get them from. And so we built it in a way so that you can actually have different stacks that are available, and BigCop is one of the stacks we'll want to support over time, and as well as leave it to the community to add more stacks. Could be the Windows stack version of, of stuff. Could be a bunch of stuff like that. Um, but really, we designed the server to understand that there's a stack definition. You can have multiple stacks that Ambari supports. And both the server should recognize that and the UI should be able to conform to that without a lot of a lot of light work. And then people should be able to come along and say, well, it looks like someone provided that stack and made that available, but that stack doesn't have a component I need. I just want that stack plus another component. So we want to support a concept of stack inheritance. So so people can come along and say, I want to take, you know, XYZ stack and add a component that's not part of it. And so I'm trying to make that easier and possible from the platform level. So. So someone could add like Hue to the stack if the stack didn't have Hue in it. Uh, <coughs> from an API level, um, really just trying to think about when you see it from the UI, you should be able to do it from an API. Um, 
from both after you've installed the cluster as well as when you're installing the cluster. So we really want to support a concept of a zero touch install where you don't have to go through a UI wizard to do it. It's still an option for people, but we're going to start promoting this idea in the open source project around a blueprint and being able to design a blueprint that represents a cluster, hand it over to the Ambari server, and it goes and lays down the cluster for you. So it's really kind of like a no interaction install for people. As well as they can integrate with the APIs and do things that we haven't even envisioned yet, like watch a metric, and possibly decommission a node, and then tell somebody they can script up against that, really trying to design for that. And then all the provider scenarios. So how do you let people plug in under the hood? Like the viewpoint guys had to bring their own provider to be able to go get system information based on their specific implementation. I just want to double click on the blueprint idea a bit. Um, so we'll start publishing a lot of this stuff and really calling for, hey, people give us feedback and help us design these things. But, you know, the base level, we're really starting to think about cluster blueprint that really defines which stack to use, what host, what service, the components, all the configs that are associated with it. It can embed the host information or have a manifest that goes with it. You hand it over to the Ambari server, it goes and does an install. And so all the wizard that uh, Yusaku walked through, that blueprint becomes useful either at the beginning, so it preloads everything for you at the end, so you can save off your config, or you take that blueprint and hand it to Ambari and never touch the UI and have it go and do the install for you. So we really feel that by defining what does it mean to represent a cluster in Hadoop and where services are and configs are, um, we'll give people the ability to satisfy a lot of use cases, either a quicker start to get a cluster installed or repeatable procedures to get the same cluster installed or no UI, no interaction way to do cluster installs. Take your blueprint, give it a list of hosts, bar you put them together and do the install for you. This is a big area. You'll see us do a lot more in open source over the coming year. That's the future in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Any questions I can answer either on the phone or chat in person? Yep. Uh, so, you know, we've been promoting, you know, Windows support for Hadoop and working closely with Microsoft to support works as a company. Um, we're actually um, working with them to see how we can make Umbari available to support installing a Windows stack over time. Right now, it's just we're focusing a lot on the Linux packaging, um, but we'll, we'll see where it ends up. Um, I'm really going to try to promote it in the community. So there's a couple things we have to figure out. We've really written Ambari in a way that it's um, kind of platform independent, um, so that makes it easy on us. So we've got Python agents. We've got a Java server. That makes it easy. We're supporting a bunch of databases, Postgres, MySQL, Oracle. That makes it easy. So it's really about trying to think about how um, the stack components come together and working with the community to make that happen. Yep. Yep. That's where it gets those little things. So that's where we might see, so the, the, the point was around Windows, um, we might see scenarios where you use Windows tools to deploy Hadoop, but then you're able to put Ambari in front of a already installed cluster to be able to get access to all the metrics and all the different controls that are there. So then you start splitting the idea that Ambari, you know, can be used to do the install as well as management, or it can be used to do management of an existing cluster. So that's the concept we want to build in there too. So. Yep. 
You gonna hit that one? To repeat the question, so the question was mostly that uh, how do other there are already existing frameworks like Tivoli and HP, how do you integrate? How do they get integrated? Uh, what what Ambari is doing and the uh, root clusters. So this is exactly what you saw with uh, with viewpoint is, is that they've built an integrated view with using the APIs of Ambari uh, in the in their product. So we expect this kind of integration integration to happen in, in other products as well. Uh, so it, it's mostly up to up to other folks to see how they want to integrate and when they want to integrate with the Ambari APIs. But I but but the focus on our APIs is exactly for the reason for exactly this reason that we'll have these third parties who want to integrate with with, uh, with Ambari and with the Hadoop ecosystem. And we want to build a uniform platform for, for them to be able to do that. So that that's where our focus is on. So we're interested in this um, the manifest um, concept because we've obviously been doing a lot of these automated builds of, of Hadoop systems. This is my question from Teradata. Um, do you have any um, insight into what this manifest is going to look like at this time, or is, that, uh, is it just going to be straight key value pairs or something more JSON slash XML? Yeah, so it sounds like we we have a question in the room. We want to finish first, then we'll come back to blue. Okay. okay. Sorry, we're not we're only hearing half the people on the phone. Just so you're aware. Okay. Okay. You go first. I think you can do that. So what we're going to do is actually um, we'll publish this out in open source and start asking for people to comment and feedback on it. So it will probably be a lot of key values and structure, like a lot of the JSON REST APIs you already saw with the responses. So follow a similar structure there with the grouping and collections and instances and things like that. Um, and really just we'll put out the basics and then just work with partners in the community to try to enhance it. So it's really early on, but I think in the next few weeks you'll see us publish it to the Ambari Wiki and we can start getting feedback on it. Any other questions out on the, the WebEx phone? Okay. I'll give it back to you. Dad. All right. Good. Uh, you were saying integrated way of managing all this and I already invested a couple of million dollars in civil. Okay. So the question is mostly that if uh, if a uh, hot uh, something that they want to use and they want to want it integrated with the Tivoli or something like that. So uh so, so just to one of the one of the things that I'd like to point out, we don't sell any licenses on a bike. It's all open source. Uh, they're free to use as this. The second thing about wanting to use Tivoli with Ambari, so we don't have a stance on, on, on what we what we will be doing. It's uh, probably up to a product team to decide. And if you want to integrate with uh, Tivoli or something, but we what we expect mostly is that a lot of integration will, have, will happen on OpenView and all these platforms very soon, uh, with, and mostly with. Yeah, and we want to enable that with the yeah. APIs and the design. So our work is mostly on enabling that.
Yeah, we'll see across the board. Use it out of the box. Willing to customize, you know, once, you know, one more kind of thing. Yep. So our first step is let's make it possible. <laughs> then we'll figure out the how and who and when in the community. Any other questions online in the room? Yeah, we're going to be hanging out for a while. Is that cool? Oh. Yeah. It's folks online and folks here. If somebody's if if you view somebody, if you have any any feedback or uh, any experience that you want to talk about, anybody here? Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Anybody else uh, who's already used? It? more of the folks will download it today and try it out and uh, give us feedback. And also, please subscribe us uh, to the Mbari Dev Community Hub. Use the mailing list at least. And if you uh, on the Mbari Dev mailing list, and it's pretty active. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, folks specifically in the last two months done a lot of releases rapidly. One to one and one to all. So we've seen a lot, seen a lot of activity over there. And it's pretty active, so feel free to jump in and uh, see a lot of help coming there if you need any. Yeah. So the question, Satish is asking a question, any reference use cases to extend it and worry to install, configure, custom uh, I'm not sure what that means. Is it, is, does that mean new components or? So the question is: Is there a way to? You want to say something? So is there a way to extend the body to install your own packages? So, so the reason that uh, this pointed out that, that specific slide on stacks and extending stacks, that is exactly what we want. We want to enable uh, providing a stack, and we will be able to extend that to say, okay, uh, we want to add one more component to it, and be able to position and, and monitor, manage that on your own. And extend that in bulk to be able to do that. Right now, it's we, there is a couple more steps than you would actually require to add new services, but we want to make it a little bit better uh, to be able to do that. Well, it depends on how <laughs> how our customers react to the new releases. <laughs> Usually, sorry. Yeah, technically you can. Do So for submitting patches, the question is, what is the uh, process for uh, submitting patches? So it's, uh, it's the process of submitting patches. It's a patch project. So 
So the process is usually you create a zero. hang around and uh, there's a lot of uh, food left. Uh, I'm surprised that there's uh, that much food left in an engineering uh, <laughs> meetup. So we can have that. There's a lot of drinks. Uh, we'll be around. Uh, just feel free to talk to us. Folks on the WebEx, sorry you cannot have the food or, uh, or the drinks here. But uh, thanks for joining and uh, definitely let us know what the feedback is on the meetup. Uh, we'll probably arrange a couple of more meetups uh, coming soon with the new releases and everything. So expect to see more on that front. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.